at least in user land, this is how memory works. A lot of people think if you pass it zero, it's going to give you nothing back. It'll actually round it to eight and give you eight bytes back. So uh, just for, to clear that up, if anyone thought you would get zero bytes back in user land. The next thing it does is pretty simple. It um, starts iterating through those blocks index structures, right? And they had the array size. And it's going to say, does the chunk I want, is it bigger than this array size? If it is, it's going to try to go to the next block's index. Um, if it doesn't have one, it's going to use the index of that special freeless zero-like structure to start searching for this allocation request. Uh, again, uh, throughout this presentation, we'll refer to this piece of code as blocks index search. OK. So now it has an index. Uh, what's it going to do? It's going to get the list hint for that certain index. And if that list hint exists, and um, the backlink of it can be anded with one, it's going to use a low fragmentation heap. Uh, if anything else fails, it will use the backend manager to uh, service this request. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that the backend manager is used in failure, whether there's no heap bucket or the front end manager fails. OK, so uh, we, uh, we have to decide which piece of this we're going to look at first. And I'd like to look at the backend manager first, because the backend manager is actually responsible for in, in, uh, activating and enabling the low fragmentation heap. Um, again, the first thing it does is it sees that list hint or free list you pass it. If it's valid, uh, you know, it goes on its way. If it's not, again, it does rounding. You pass it zero bytes, you're still going to get eight. Um, the next thing it looks at is, uh, does this heap support serialization? And if it does not, the low fragmentation heap will never be used. Uh, you need to support serialization for the low fragmentation heap ever to be used. Um, if serialization is supported, it checks the compatibility flags. Uh, if these certain flags are set, uh, it calls this function, perform heap maintenance. This is what will actually activate the low fragmentation heap. Uh, if you just create a heap and start making allocations, they will not come from the low fragmentation heap. They will come from the backend manager until, until certain heuristics are met. Well, how exactly do these flags get set? Um, they get set, again, by the backend manager. It checks the free list, did you pass it? Is it null? Uh, if it's not, and it doesn't contain a heap bucket, that's where the, the logical and one comes there, it adds a constant to it. And this constant is the one that we saw in our free list example. If it exceeds a certain amount, it's going to say, OK, get me the front, front end manager from the heap and, and try to get a heap bucket from it. Um, if this heap bucket returns null, that means that the low fragmentation heap is yet to be activated. And it will set uh, the compatibility flags uh, if the threshold has been met. Um, if a heap bucket is uh, given back, uh, it will actually store that heap bucket in the backlink. So the next subsequent request for this size will be serviced by the low fragmentation heap instead of the backend. OK, now that all the, uh, the heuristics are done for the low fragmentation heap, it will actually service the request from the back end. This is strikingly similar to how it was done in Windows XP Service Pack 2. Uh, it checks to see if the list hint you gave it uh, contains a chunk. And if it does, we're going to safely unlink it. And, you know, and by safely unlink it, it's going to make sure that its forward link and back link values aren't tainted. Um, if everything goes well, it unlinks the chunk from the list and gives it back to you. But if there was an, uh, a, a list hint for that certain size and it, and it doesn't work, we're going to have to go to our starting at mile zero for US1 type scenario. It's going to start at the beginning of the list head, which is the same as the heap free list, right? And it's going to just start traversing those. In, in, the previous, in the example I gave, it would start at that first chunk for six blocks. Um, if the list head is empty, or the largest chunk on that, on that free list can't service this request, it's going to need to extend the heap. And when I say extend the heap, it's going to need to commit more memory so it can service this request. Um, if that's not the case, uh, it starts going through these chunk headers, uh, gets one, splits it up if necessary, and gives it back to the user. The backend allocator does a, a plethora of things. It, it activates the low fragmentation heap. It actually calculates heuristics to determine if the low fragmentation heap should be used. Um, so, and then it'll service the request or, or get more memory. Um, now we'll see how the front end allocator works, the low fragmentation heap. And this is a big blob of code, and it's ugly. But it's easier to explain, actually, than it is to read. 
uh, the first thing that happens is that heat bucket that was stored in the backlink is passed. And the low fragmentation heat uh, structure, uh, the pointer for it, is actually calculated from that heat bucket based on size. So they don't pass a pointer uh, of the low fragmentation heap there. They actually calculate it based off the bucket size. And uh, in Ben Hawke's awesome paper in 2008, he theorized that if you could uh, munge up this heat bucket in the size, you could potentially get a pointer back to a low fragmentation heap that wasn't so. Um, that being said, the main goal of this is to get that heap subsegment based on the size, and it does that. Uh, it gets the local segment info, and it tries the hint first. Uh, the hint subsegment is only set if you've freed a chunk of that size. If you never free a chunk of that size, which in a real-world scenario never happens, but if you never do, the hint won't be set. It'll use the active subsegment. Um, the code for these two things are identical, so I've only listed them one here, but basically in this example, you can replace the, the, the member hint with active subsegment, and it works exactly the same. So, what does it want to do? It has this big chunk of memory, right, that we talked about, uh, the user block. Well, the first thing it's going to do is get that interlock sequence structure, and it's going to get the free entry offset. The free entry offset tells you where, where's the first free trunk I can grab. Um, based on that, if, if, if the subsegment is in working order, which I, I guess I'll talk a, a little bit more about later, um, it gets the chunk based off that offset. But how does it calculate the, the next offset? Well, it looks at the first two bytes of the chunk that you've just grabbed and uses that as the next free offset. But that first two bytes is in user-readable and user-writable memory. So this is the whole premise for my free entry offset attack. Uh, again, we'll talk about more about this in the, the exploitation section. Um, the depth is easy. It decrements it by one. You've just taken one chunk from the user block. Um, if all goes well, it returns it to the user. If it doesn't go well, there's no user blocks. The depth is zero, which means there's no chunks left in it, right? Um, it's going to have to acquire more memory via the back end for the front end manager to use. This brings us to uh, what I refer to as the magic formula, because it's magic. Uh, it it it's, uh, looks complex, but just think of it as rounding it to the nearest page aligned value to allocate memory for a certain size. Uh, if you can do that, it's pretty simple. Then it calls the function RTLP allocate user block. Um, this, by its name, obviously, gets that big chunk from the back end manager. Um, there is some caching and some indexing. Uh, if you read my paper, I talk about it more. But we'll just assume this is a wrapper for a call to uh, the back end manager. Now that it's allocated a large chunk of memory for that user block, it's going to need a subsegment to couple it with, right? Because that subsegment uh, uh, holds a pointer to this user block. Well, it does this either by using one that was previously deleted, or it'll grab one from a, a pool of memory addresses. Uh, so instead of just allocating enough memory for uh, you know, one subsegment at a time, it's going to actually allocate this big bunch of memory uh, and, and uh, take a, a piece when needed. And when it runs out, it'll allocate more. Um, and again, this, this uh, I talk about in the observation section because it, it, it struck me as something that, that you could abuse if about 415 prerequisites are made. Um, now, that, now that you've gotten memory for a subsegment, you're going to have to initialize it. And what does initialization mean? It's going to take that user block, and um, it's, it, it, it needs to split it up. The way it splits it up is by um, determining how big that block is and then dividing it by the size that you requested. So it takes that user chunk, it subtracts the size of a user data header, because we all know that precedes the user block, and then just divides it by that number and iterates through it. It doesn't actually take this memory and move it anywhere or set up a linked list. It just writes a heap entry or a chunk header every so often. So for 30 hex bytes, every 30 hex bytes, there's going to be an 8-byte header. And uh, it, it's pretty simple. There is two things to note. Uh, the interlock sequence uh, structure, the, uh, the free entry offset will always be initialized to two. It's always initialized to two because that heap user data header is 16 bytes. It's measured in blocks. Two times eight is 16. Um, the other neat thing to know is the last chunk in that user block, uh, it's two byte next free entry offset is set to negative one. Um, so if you could somehow you know, read this value and you got to negative one, you would know that you've reached the last block in that chunk. OK. I think the best way to show how the allocation from user blocks uh, uh, occurs is with an example. Um, 
In this example, I'm going to use size 30 hex, uh, 30 hex bytes for each chunk. Um, and um, you see that the, the, this is a full chunk. We just got it from the backend manager, and it's just been split up. And now we can make you know, an allocation. The first allocation is the free entry offset is at 2. That's the first chunk. Uh, the depth is 2a. That, that, that number is based off uh, the, the magic formula. Um, I like to think of this as a big Sicilian pizza from Minio's in Squirrel Hill. So if anyone's from Pittsburgh, they'll know where that is. But um, you have this big pizza, and they're in big square slices. So let's say it's 2 in the morning, and you have Dr. Raid come over for late night pizza party, right? And uh, Dr. Raid's going to grab a slice, first thing, pushes everyone out of the way, your grandma, whatever, just to get his first slice. Um, you see what happened, right? The free entry offset is uh, updated to offset of 8, because that's what was stored in the first two bytes. Uh, the depth, decremented by 1, simple. Um, Dr. Raid, being the jerk that he is, is going to grab another slice before anyone else at the party gets any. So now he has two slices of pizza on his plate, and no one else has any. Again, depth, decremented by one. Free entry offset, up, uh, updated to uh, you know, the next entry. Keep in mind that Dr. Raid has two pieces of pizza right now. No one has any. Uh, and, and we'll continue this example in the freeing section. OK, on to freeing. Freeing, just like allocation, kind of has that stub function, RTL free heap. And this is just going to determine whether you should use uh, the low fragmentation heap or the back end. Um, it will do a few checks first. If you pass it null, it will return to you. If you pass it a non 8 byte aligned uh, memory address, it will log the heap failure and return to you. So you can't pass null or non 8 byte aligned addresses. Um, the next neat thing that I saw is it checks the uh, chunk header's unused bytes. We'll just call it unused bytes. It's at offset 7. If that can be bitwise added with hex 80, it will use the, the, the low fragmentation heap. Um, if it can't, uh, then it'll use the back end. Uh, the neat thing to realize right here is that, uh, that piece of information in the chunk header isn't encoded. So if you can get an 8 byte overwrite, you can actually overwrite this value and free a chunk with the low fragmentation heap instead of the back end when it was allocated from the, uh, the back end uh, uh, manager. OK, we'll start with the back end just for consistency reasons here. And, and we'll see a few things. Uh, we'll, we see that search blocks index function, right, where it gets you an offset into the list hints. Um, if, if that list hint uh, can contain a value uh, and it doesn't contain a heat bucket, it's going to subtract two from it. And this is used in the heuristic to determine whether ever to uh, uh, enable the low fragmentation heap for this size. So even if you did 400 uh, allocation-free, allocation-free combos, the low fragmentation heap for that size would never be enabled. You need consecutive allocations for this to happen. OK, we've, uh, you know, we've updated these, these flags uh, and done some things. Uh, if the heap permits, coalesce it, right? Uh, if the previous chunk is free, coalesce it with the chunk we're freeing. If the next chunk is free, coalesce the chunk we're freeing. Update the sizes. Uh, you know, that, 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 again, can be looked at more thoroughly in uh, a, a paper written by uh, Dr. McDonald and myself from 2009. All right. So now we've officially done everything we need to do. Uh, we've updated the low fragmentation heuristic. We, we've coalesced the chunks. Uh, how, do you, how do you link this guy back in? Well. You know, it, it's first going to attempt to determine, can, can we actually, you know, can we free this chunk in a certain location? Um, if that list head doesn't contain any entries, it's easy. We're going to uh, link it in the first spot. No need to do anything else. Um, otherwise, you know, try to find that list hint, uh, you know, and, and it, traverse that, that, that entry until it finds a chunk bigger than itself. So what it does is inserts itself before the chunk that's bigger than it. Um, this, again, is similar to Windows XP, but there are some changes. Um, and here are the changes that I found uh, strikingly sad for exploit writers. Um, when it finds that list where it's inserting, and in our example, say we're freeing a chunk uh, of size uh, six blocks, right? Um, it wouldn't insert it first before all of them. It would traverse through all the, the blocks of size six, and then when it hit that one of seven, it would insert it before the one in seven. Well, before, um, Brett Moore had the ingenious idea that if you overwrote the backlink of one of these uh, and you could insert it before it, the, and if you overwrote the backlink, you could uh, have that address point to the chunk you just freed. 
this really isn't the case anymore. They do a check, uh, which we'll talk about more. You see that inserts B-link, F-link equals insert list. Uh, it's just making sure that it's backlink, for link points to itself. Um, if not, there's a, a log of a heap failure, but uh, eventually uh, you'll see, you know, the, the chunk that you just freed will be, uh, uh, the uh, list hint will be updated for it.